Thank you for joining us for our webinar on investing today. I uh, hope everyone's doing well out there. And my name is Josh. Uh, I'm in the Community Relations Department here at California Coast Credit Union. I uh, just wanted to introduce myself. I'll be uh, moderating for today. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to include them in the question and answer box or the chat box. And we will be sure to answer those either as we go or at the end of today's presentation. Also, uh, this session is being recorded, so we will have it up on our uh, YouTube channel. I'll place the link in the chat box so you can take a look at that later. So don't worry about taking vigorous notes or anything like that. You can always go back and check the info again one more time uh, once we have the recording up and running for you. Uh, so with that, I just wanna get right into it here because I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. So I wanna introduce our, our uh, presenter today. His name is Kyle Johnson. He is a uh, certified financial advisor with California Coast Financial Services. Uh, he's done a few of these presentations for us now and uh, I'm sure he's got a lot of great uh, new information to share with us along with all the usual info. So Kyle, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Um, yeah. So Josh said, I'm Kyle Johnson, financial advisor here. Um, and uh, our role here at, at CalCoast is to make sure that our members are, are thriving, I guess. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I know that, um, you know, there's a lot more to just kind of putting your money in the bank as we're going to kind of see today. And, uh, and so uh, when you have certain needs like retirement planning, um, you know, college funding, um, long-term care needs, things like that, uh, that's kind of where we step in. Anything outside of just the traditional type of, um, you know, CDs, savings accounts, stuff like that. Um, we're talking about investments. Um, uh, that's kind of where we step in. So I guess we'll kind of get this started here. Um, and so... I guess I will share my screen and talk a little bit about uh, investing 101. Um, so what I'm going to try to do here is uh, make this as um, as seamless as possible for you guys. Um, and let me go ahead and share this. So um, I'll try to make it quick. Um, you know, it's a it's a really good presentation, and especially in today's economy with everything that's going on, uh, it's about as relevant today as it as have has ever been. And so I'm going to walk through, um, you know, how we as as financial advisors look at investing, uh, how you should look at investing, um, and talk about some of the. Um, I guess some of the different functions of investing and some of the ingredients that go into it um, that are affecting what's going on right now, um, uh, as we can kind of see. And so I'll try to kind of breeze through this a little bit just to leave room for questions, because I know that oftentimes questions tend to be the most valuable part of this uh, type of um, presentation, right? So, um, you know, we're going to go through why, why to invest, right? Um, you know, investment basics. We'll talk a little bit about mutual funds um, and ETFs, and we'll also talk about uh, asset allocation. And then we'll talk about why maybe it's it's best to invest early and to invest now. Um, and then we'll we'll have some room for questions. Okay. So why invest? Um, if we were in a room, I would probably have you raise your hand and say how how many of you see this and see something familiar right? Uh, almost all of your hands would probably go up. Um, so, um, you know, reasons for investing are, uh, are broad, right? Um, everybody has different goals. Everyone has fine, different, uh, a different financial plan, a different financial outlook. And essentially, and investments are really just a tool that we use in order to get you where you need to go, right? Financial planning at its very core is where are you now? Where do you want to be? how do we get you there financially, right? And that's the, where the planning part comes in. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, depending on your risk tolerance, depending on, on your goals and depending on your time horizon, um, we're gonna choose different types of investments in order to try to get you from point A to point B, right? So how do we get from here to there? Um, some of the investment basics. So I mentioned CDs before. The reason I bring this up is because, you know, oftentimes one of our one of our main 
um, questions that we get. And one of the main reasons why I see members here is, hey, you know what? What's going on with your CD rates, right? Why why am I not making the what I made, you know, you know, four years ago, right? Um, and so the reason being is that uh, you know really interest rates, right? Uh, after COVID, we had uh, our Fed became, you know, started to reduce um, uh, interest rates to have some sort of quantitative easing to make money a little bit easier for people, so we can uh, kind of. Cr- crawl out of that and come out a little bit healthier on the other side. Um, Some of the issues we've run into today are because we've had too much free money for too long. Um, And we can go into that in a little bit. Uh, However, you know, even since 2008, interest rates have been pretty, pretty low. Um, And so this graph, um, you know, and so a low interest rate really isn't necessarily a bad thing in a vacuum, right? So, a low interest rate is fine if you just want to make some money, um, but really, it's a low interest rate compared to what, right? Uh, that's the question that we should be asking, and the answer is it's a low interest rate compared to inflation, right? And so, um, as financial advisors, we want to make sure that that our members are making at least um, what at least what inflation is bringing to the table, um, if not more, right? So if you want to buy that house or if you want to, you know, save up for that car or any of those goals that we had listed ahead of time or in that last slide, right? Then, um, you know, if you make a 5% re- return on your CD, great. You made a 5% return on the CD. That sounds awesome. But if inflation, if your house is going up at a rate of 5% or if your house is going up at a rate of you know 10 percent um then it doesn't do you much good right so um you know all that to say um i think it's uh really important that you you stick to your guns um and you create a you get some of your money that's investing outside of just that fixed income range um or else as you can kind of see your after tax inflation adjusted return is going to be uh, a lot lower than what you have is your actual return, right? Um, and so you're going to be losing purchasing power going into retirement, going into, um, you know, saving for a house, whatever it is. Um, so that's really important. Um, inflation, right? Um, right now, uh, I would, again, if we were live, I'd probably ask a question. Does anybody know what the rate of inflation is right now? Um, <laughs> the rate of inflation right now is about, higher than last year. Um, uh, There's some CPI metrics, depending on what you're measuring, right? Um, Core CPI, what the the Fed looks at, was at about 6.5% compared to last year. Uh, They came out with that that reading just uh, yesterday, actually. So um, all that to be said, if you're not making at least 6.5% on your money uh, over the last year anyways, right? Um, then, um, then you're actually losing money to inflation, right? And we can have questions about inflation a little bit later, but, um, the main reason that we have inflation now, uh, has a lot to do with the supply chain. Um, and also, you know, obviously it has a little bit to do with, with, uh, I guess an easy monetary policy over the last couple of years from the fed, but really what it boils down to at the end of the day is more so, um, the supply chain that, that had been stopped during COVID, uh, has been restarting, um, and we've had an increased demand as well, right? Um, that kind of has compounded upon that. Um, we can talk about, you know, what what my expectations are for for inflation. Uh, a lot of people are thinking it's probably about peaked. But that being said, um, even if it drops down to four percent, three percent, the Fed has a target rate of two and a half percent, right? And so, um, you know, if all things go well and you know you know we really start producing things um you still need to be making at least two and a half percent in order to um to keep pace with inflation right i think it's going to be maybe a little while until we get back to those levels um so you know but in the meantime i think it's important that you put your money to work um and that um you start to grow uh your money um you know 
with the economy. One of the best inflation hedges we'll kind of go over in the uh, um, historically, as we'll go over in a little bit later, is actually the stock market, right? So, um, you know, reason being, you know, companies have assets. Those assets, uh, you know, like let's just say cars, buildings, you know, things like IP. Um, uh, not only can they pass through some of those costs to consumers, but also that grows with inflation. So the value of the company grows as inflation rises. Um, so uh, the three main asset classes that we tend to invest in when we're talking about investments are stocks, bonds, money market, which is really just cash, right? So money market is really um, your emergency funds, right? So you know, we generally, as advisors, we try to recommend that you have at least six months of, of, um, uh, of cash on hand to cover your uh, six months of expenses in cash, right? If you have two people working, um, maybe four months is fine. Uh, if it's just you, probably about six months of cash on hand. So just um, if nothing else, it's important to have cash on hand, uh, not just to pay for emergency expenses, um, in case you lose your job, right? So it gives you six months to kind of find a new job, but also because um, it allows you to invest and let them uh, let the market kind of have some fluctuations like it has recently and still remain confident and just say, hey, I'm going to put this away. It's more of a, men it's almost as, as much of a benefit as from a behavioral standpoint as it is for um, for emergency funds, right? So, hey, I'm putting this money away. This is being invested. I'm comfortable with that uh, because I have this amount of cash and I know I can cover some expenses, right? Um, so let's walk through this. So stocks um, uh, tend to be our gas pedal in the investment uh, portfolio, right? So stocks are partial ownership of a company, right? And so as, uh, as I mentioned before, let's just say Apple, right? As Apple sells more iPhones, as they buy new buildings, as they create new products, and create intellectual property that other companies have to pay them to use um, on their technology, um, app developers, things like that, then, then the company gains more in value, right? So that little piece of ownership of that company that you have is worth more. Um, just think about it, you know, even from a very simple standpoint, if you have this box that's generating, you know, that's bringing in more money, the more money that that box generates, if you own part of it, right? Um, and it keeps bringing more and more money than that dollar, that partial ownership is, is naturally going to be worth more, right? Um, the volatility portion of, of stocks is that um, they're valued at uh, what people expect earnings to be in the future. And so it's not, uh, it's a forward looking mechanism and it's not looking backwards. Hey, how much is this company worth? You can look at those metrics. We call that the book value. Um, but but really, people are trying to say, hey, what do I think this company is going to be uh, worth in the next few years? How much do I think they're going to be making in the next few years? Um, and what is that? Uh, what is that? Um, what are those earnings when we compare it to what the risk-free rate of return is, which is what uh, what the Fed it would be willing to give us, right? So, uh, because they can put their own money, uh, it's risk-free. Bonds, uh, on the other hand, are a um, are simply a contract that you have with either a, um, a municipality or a company or a, uh, the federal government, uh, and the, in, um, uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a government bond, uh, but it's essentially a contract that says, Hey, I'm going to give you some money. Uh, you give me a coupon in the meantime, and then give me my money in return. It's a loan. Right. Uh, so it tends the, the bonds tend to be a lot less volatile than stocks, but they tend to give you a return over time, as you can see here. Right. Um, CDs tend to be uh, pretty low, um, as we can see historically. Um, and T bills also tend to be, you know, three month T bills are, are even lower than that. Right. And so those are short term debts. Um, you know, this is about, you know, like I said, if you're doing business with the government, we call it the risk-free rate of return because it's as safe as you can get because the government can print their own money, right? If they need to repay you. Uh, companies and municipalities can't. Um, so um, it's important to own both. 
for a lot of people. For um, We want to make sure that our clients have uh, managed their risk by having exposure to a little bit in the stock market, a little bit in the bond market. So you can get that coupon that's a consistent type of, of growth um, while also having some exposure to the equities market. So you can have a lot more of that high growth, um, you know, so we can combine maybe some home runs with some singles and doubles, right? So, and, and ultimately smooth out your, uh, the journey along the way, right? We really want to create a, a risk adjusted return for you over time, um, that, um, that suits your, you know, risk tolerance, your time horizon, all sorts of stuff, right? Um, so, um, so the the best annual returns um, have been you know somewhere around thirty three percent, and the bond market, the best annual returns have been about twelve percent. So it says, whoa, hey, stock market seems to be a lot more, uh, you know, have a lot better return than the bond market. Why would I ever invest in bonds, right? Well. You know, if, oh, sorry, let me go back. Sorry. Um, well, um, the worst, you know, in 08, we'll call it, the worst annual return for the stock market was also 37%, right? Uh, the worst annual return for the bond market was about negative 2%, right? And so um, we've recently had a swing in the bond market because interest rates have been going up. And so we've actually seen a drop of, you know, closer to 5% uh, in the bond market. The year isn't over with, so we expect that to come back up uh, and normalize by year end, um, and it will. Um, but again, um, some of, uh, you know, some of the rationale here is that, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, the highs do come with the lows, and they eventually will always come with the lows. And so making sure that you're able to stomach that, have a smooth ride through all of that. And so we can have some dry powder to maybe um, uh, to maybe draw from in the event of a downturn in the market is a big deal. Um, so, so mutual funds and ETFs, we like to have diversification in our portfolios, right? So uh, diversification means uh, exposure to different asset classes, right? So bonds, stocks, right? But within stocks, there's a lot of different types of stocks that we can go over. And there's a lot of different types of bonds. Like I mentioned, corporate bonds, those are companies, right? Uh, municipalities, uh, those are municipal bonds. So these are cities, right? Um, and then uh, in states. And then we have, uh, you know, treasury bonds, things like that. And so, um, and they're not all created equal. Same with stocks. Stocks, you can have growth stocks, um, you know, uh, value stocks that we'll go through um, a little bit, uh, but cheaper stocks. So um, in general, you know, uh, I'll say uh, a an Apple is not the same as maybe a Coca-Cola, right? Um, they're very different types of companies. They function differently. They have different um, uh, revenue streams and growth projections, right? And so they're going to look a little bit different. And a biotech stock is going to look a lot different from both of those, right? And so um, having a mutual fund and an ETF um, gives you the the opportunity to own um, a broad swath of different companies within your investments. Um, so you're buying, uh, you know, I guess something could happen to, let's see, even I'll continue to use Apple as an example, um, but even something could even happen to Apple, right? So if if China invades Taiwan, for instance, right? That's a risk for Apple. Um, that's not necessarily a risk for Coca-Cola, right? Um, if, um, you know, there could be some sort of uh, government um, agency that says, hey, we think that, um, that you have a monopoly in this space for a certain particular company, uh, maybe that, and they could go after maybe Amazon for that, but they're probably not gonna go after Amazon and Microsoft and Apple, right? So um, even if it's in the same type of sector, having exposed, you know, one thing can happen to a company, it's very unlikely for a particular instance to happen to a bunch of companies. And so um, mutual funds are, and ETFs are, sent, are essentially just baskets of stock um, that, are typically uh, designed for a specific type of purpose. So um, you could go even with sectors, which we'll go over in a little bit. Um, you know, 
maybe you're interested in investing in just solar, right? Uh, you have a bunch of different solar companies in just this one basket. Maybe you want just growth stocks and maybe you just want value stocks and maybe you're looking for just dividends, right? And so we could have uh, in mutual funds, mutual funds are actively managed. And so they're trading a bunch of stocks and they're picking, hey, we think that this one's going to be better than this one. And so you have to look at the management and the track record of the management um, for a mutual fund uh, in order to get a really good idea of, of, of how they're going to perform um, and, and filter through, hey, which ones are the best for which types of, um, um, uh, I guess, goals that you're going for, right? Or different sectors that you want to be, different exposures you want to have, right? Maybe there's a manager that's very good at the bond space, let's just say PIMCO, tends to be really good in the bond space. And then maybe Franklin Templeton's really good in the growth space, right? Um, and so you need to kind of filter through that. Um, and that's kind of what we do for, for our members, right? Uh, and we also want to make sure that we change exposure as the, uh, as the economy changes and as the stock market changes, right? So again, mutual funds have diversification, professional management, um, it's convenient. Uh, to just buy a mutual fund rather than buy a bunch of individual stocks. Uh, it's affordable, right? So um, this allows you to have exposure to, let's just say an Amazon, right? Um, uh, and a bunch of different other companies. Uh, you know, one share of Amazon, for instance, is three, a little over $3,000 as of today, right? $3,300. Um, so if you have a portfolio of, you know, $20,000, that's going to be a big overweight in your portfolio. And so, um, you know, by being able to buy a bunch of different stocks and have them in uh, just one basket allows you to diversify with less money, right? So that's what we call the affordability, um, liquidity. Um, you know, uh, uh, the stocks, you know, mutual funds in general and uh, mutual funds and ETFs in general are pretty liquid, right? So if you need to, you know, Let's just say if you have an expense that you need and you want to take some money out of your account, um, typically we would make a trade if it's before one o'clock that day, um, the money would, the trade would go through the next day, the cash would be available and the day after you probably would have your money. Um, so, um, you know, rather than buying gold or buying a house or anything like that, um, you know, investments, uh, traditional types of portfolios tend to have a lot more liquidity. Right. Um, so you can have, you know, access to it and have cash uh, relatively quickly. Um, so mutual fund risks. Right. So what are the risks that are involved in mutual funds? So like I said before, um, you know, the stock market, as you probably know, and the bond market, right, they go up and down. Right. So so there's no real principal protection. Right. Um, you're you're exposed to what we call systematic risk, uh, which means uh, it's built into the system. Uh, so principal market risk, um, a, you may have heard the, the term a rising tide, you know, uh, floats all boats. Um, and so, um, you know, there is cyclicality involved in the stock market. And you see this, it, the longer you invest, the longer you see there are cycles. So right now we're in the middle of the cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, the important thing is, is, is to, uh, to make sure that you have um, some patience, right? So one one phrase that uh, a famous phrase I like to use is, um, you know, uh, investing is the constant need to replace fear and greed with patience, uh, context, and perspective, right? And so as you invest, uh, having context and taking a, a longer look back and make and remembering your goals and why you're investing in the first place, what your time horizon is, is really, really important. Um, and also, um, you know, you know, sticking to your guns as far as what your assumptions are, right? If you, if, uh, and we can go over this in a little bit if you want in the questions, um, but one of, you know, uh, right now, if you look at the stock market, um, one of the sectors that's really out of favor right now is technology, right? And so if, if you were to just have hopped into the stock market today, um, you know, a lot of people would think, whoa, technology, that's, that's really risky. It's, it's not a good investment, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, but if you're, you know, 
uh, if you're a long-term investor and you go, hey, I think technology is going to be probably leading the way in terms of uh, our economy and have the most, uh, you know, we've transitioned into a remote workspace. We're having a meeting on Zoom today. Um, you know, there's a lot of really solid, um, you know, growth prospects in the technology space moving forward over the next five to 10 years. And so if you look at it at maybe weakness today and you look at it as, as an opportunity instead, um, that's a completely different mindset than, oh my gosh, technology is really out of favor. Let's pull the plug, right? And so these are often the types of conversations we have with some of our clients. Um, you know, have your views changed? You know, you know if they have, why? Um, so, um, another thing is interest rate risk, right? So we just, uh, had talked about that. So interest rates. So as interest rates go up, right. Um, uh, markets tend to go down, right. Um, there's less money, uh, that's freely available to a lot of different companies. Uh, that's part of it. But what we're really seeing right now is we're seeing that, um, interest rates going up. Um, and the prospect of interest rates going up is really bring, bringing stock prices down. I'm going to try to keep it high level for you and, and try not to go into too much detail as to why. Uh, but, um, but essentially, as the, if let's just say the risk-free rate of return goes higher in the future, and we're expecting it to be higher. So the Fed kind of giving, uh, you know, if I can invest in a bond in two years from now, that's going to be worth you know, a percent higher than it is today, then, um, then the value, the present day value of, of what company earnings are or what the stock price you're paying for future earnings is going to come down as well. Um, if, uh, the reason being is that people, um, uh, in a perfect market, people choose stocks, um, as a comparison to a risk-free rate of return, right? And so they say, hey, for the risk I'm taking, I'm willing to uh, compare to a risk-free rate of return. Uh, and given the growth projections that we have, um, I need to be rewarded X amount in order to be able to, you know, for me to want to take this risk, right? And so, um, uh, so as the interest rates go up or expected interest rates go up in the future, then that number becomes smaller, right? And so you can think of it a little bit kind of like a, uh, a fulcrum, right? And so uh, the more expensive stocks, which tend to be more, more growth-oriented stocks because they have uh, higher growth pro prospects in the future, right? They have higher rates of return, higher uh, expected adoption rates, things like that, they tend to be more expensive. And so if there's a little change in the interest rates here, then you're going to see a bigger uh, a bigger change in the actual price, share price. Now, right now, what's in favor are value stocks, right? Why is that? Because when you raise the interest rates, you change it and they're not as expensive, it doesn't move as much, right? So you don't really see as much volatility in those value stocks that are cheaper, right? Um, they're cheaper because, you know, they're, they tend to be more mature companies that have, let's just say, we'll call it Coca-Cola, right? Um, there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of people in the world who haven't heard of Coca-Cola, right? So their total addressable market um, right now is about as mature as you can get. So they, yes, they make good cash flow. Yes, they they have a good business, but they're not growing at a tremendously uh, large rate, right? Um, maybe five, ten percent a year versus a lot of these other technology companies that have, you know huge amounts of opportunity in front of them where they might be growing at uh, 20, 30, 40% per year. Um, and so right now we're just seeing an adjustment. We're seeing the market just kind of adjust to, to future um, interest rates. And we'll see the, the, the winners again kind of take off eventually, right? But right now we're going through a transition period. So um, foreign risk. So moving back to the slides, foreign risk is simply, hey, uh, this is a risk. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it could be geopolitical risk. It could be interest or uh, uh, currency risk, right? 
Um, so there's just risks that are involved with investing in another country. Um, so uh, like I said, uh, currency conversion, stuff like that. So, um, like I said, there we have different types of funds. We have growth funds, right? So um, growth funds, uh, they tend to have, um, you know, little dividends, right? Little to zero dividends, right? With those types of funds, because uh, investors are being rewarded by share price appreciation, right? Value funds, value funds tend to be, uh, they call them value funds because they tend to be cheaper companies. Um, the way that we judge a cheap company is typically by what we call a PE ratio. So the price of the share uh, versus the earnings of the company. So the price per share uh, over the earnings um, you know, the lower the price for the earnings that they have, that's why they call it a value, right? Um, companies who are more growth oriented companies, uh, investors tend to look a little bit further into the future. So the price tends to be higher versus their current earnings, right? Because they're looking to the, to future earnings, uh, as the gauge, uh, as to why they, they would buy it. Uh, value funds tend to offer more dividends because they, that's the way that they, that's one of the ways that they reward investors for, uh, for, you know, purchasing the stock. And so, um, again, um, depending on who you are and your, your needs and your goals in the future, um, uh, we have different asset allocations uh, for um, the types of investors for whatever type of investor that you are, right? Uh, sector funds, again, so this could be healthcare, um, consumer staples, uh, utilities, um, like I said, even solar technology, um, you know, it's just different sectors of, 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 um, of the economy that you have exposure to, right? But it allows you to have a broad swath of it. Um, bond fund investings, right? So we have taxable bond funds, which are usually more of uh, corporate types of bond funds. So um, tax-free bond funds are really just anything with, with the government tends to be uh, tax efficient, right? And so a treasury bond is federally tax-free. Municipal bond, if it's in the same state and if it's in the same city, right? I mean, you may be exempt from not only federal tax on, on the coupons that you get from it, right? Uh, but you might have state tax exemption and maybe, you know, uh, San Diego, city of San Diego exemptions, right? So, um, you know, there are certain risks that are, in, that are invested, that um, associated with investing in bond funds. Um, so, uh, and we can go over that. Like I said, bond funds have gone down this year and I'll kind of give you a quick glimpse as to why. Um, and so, um, you know, here's, Here's a, a quick slide on, on global investing. I don't want to go too far into it. There is opportunity in global investing. Um, uh, you know, like it, you can see here, um, uh, you know, 54% of the stock market cap is in, uh, is in the United States. There's actually more than this now in foreign. And there's also, uh, in the bond space, there's a lot more uh, foreign uh, fixed income out there that you can access as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities in foreign. Um, you know, again, you know, there's all these different types of uh, countries that you can invest in and, and a lot of opportunities, maybe not over here anymore in, in Russia, but, <laughs> um, uh, but it was a joke. Um, but there's a lot of different opportunities out there. Uh, should you look for them? That being said, um, you know, there are more risks involved with investing in foreign um, countries. And so um, you need to know you, if, if I'm going to invest in a, in a foreign country um, or have exposure to a foreign country, I typically would want to rely on a mutual fund manager. Why is that? Uh, we need somebody who knows the space, right? Um, I try to take, you know, right now I would keep your exposure relatively limited. Um, you know, the most consistent game in town is the United States and it continues to be the United States. Um, and so having too much foreign investment um, can be an issue. There are opportunities for sure, but you need to be careful. Um, again, going back to the manager, why would I want to do that? Is um, typically I want someone with boots on the ground, 
um, who, wherever I'm investing, um, you know, every, if you've traveled a lot, you, you know, every country is different. Um, you know, knowing the ins and outs of, of kind of where you are, who uses what, um, it's really important. And so, um, so having somebody who can actually select stocks, who they, you know, who, who has boots on the ground, who is there, um, is really important. Um, so, um, I'm going to skip through a little bit of this asset allocation. It's just really important to have, uh, have a, uh, a broad, a broad blend of, of different, um, companies, uh, in different sectors, right? So you can see here through the, if you follow the blue, the, uh, the blue dots here, the large growth in 97, 98, we're at the top and then 99, they went down a little bit in 2000, they're at the bottom, right? And you could see them, uh, you know, uh, kind of every year was, uh, was kind of, uh, was a little rough for them. And then you see them going back up. This is just to tell you that, that just because they're the, um, they're the best stock, you know, you know, you may like a certain sector. It's, 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 it's appropriate to have a blend of different types of exposures. Um, just so, just because, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, nobody, uh, including us. And if they tell you they do that, then they're lying. Um, and so, uh, you gotta be careful. You just have to be diversified. Um, and, and, and be patient when you're investing. So, um, so here's three popular strategies. I do like this slide. Um, three popular strategies for investing, right? Uh, chasing the winners, right? Investing in last year's best performing asset class, right? So if you just looked at, hey, who did the best last year? And then just dumped your money into that, that asset class, your, your average total return would have been 6.92%, right? Um, investing with the losers. So maybe you picked the worst asset class last year, right? So this would have worked for you this year because in 2020, uh, you know, oil was doing terrible um, and was the absolute worst performer. And now this year, oil is the best, absolute best performer, right? Um, so if you would have invested with the loser, um, your actually annual return would have been better than just chasing the winners, right? So, so again, consistency is really good in having a, um, uh, having, uh, I guess, conviction about certain types of strategies and sticking to that is a really big deal with investing. Uh, investing with a loser, you would have actually made more, but if you would have had just a blended asset allocation, you would have been, you would have made more than either of these uh, types of strategies, right? And so again, um, you know, this is one of my, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Sir John Templeton. Uh, History shows that time, not timing is the key to investment success. So um, you know, said otherwise, um, you know, time in the market is more important than timing the market. Right. And so, um, having exposure to the, uh, to the stock market long-term and just sticking with your guns is a very, very, very important, um, I can't stress it enough, important part of investing. Right. So, um, you know, if you had ten thousand dollars and you invested on the absolute best days over the last uh, twenty years, right? So let's just say, and by what this means is, you take ten thousand dollars and you invest at the low. You pick the absolute low for the year, and then you see it shoot up, and you're, you're like, "Man, I am really good at investing." Wow. The next year, same thing. You pick the best day, invest low, and then and then you see what happens, right? Um, you would have made, you know, 9%. Great. Now, if you're the absolute worst at investing, right, you pick the absolute worst day every year and you go, I'm going to invest at a top, boom. And then it goes to the bottom. You're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Next year, invest at the top, boom. Oh my gosh, I'm really bad at this. Um, you still, you know, the point here is just be, um, you may have invested at the worst time, but because you left your money in the market and you, because you consistently added more every single year, you still would have made uh, money. You only been off by about 2%. That's really not a lot, uh, especially if you're considering the absolute best days versus the absolute worst days, right? And so the key here is again, consistency. Um, you know, right now th there's always a disaster du jour, 
right? Right now it's inflation and the interest rates and everything going up. Um, you know, it was COVID, right? We had a huge disaster du jour, right? Uh, entire global economy shutting down, right? We had the same situation that we're having right now in 2018, but oh, by the way, we had a trade war with the largest economy in the world, which is China, the second largest economy in the world, which is China. Um, so talk about prices going up, right? Um, you know, before that's Kim Jong-un, you know, I can go through on and on. I actually have a slide for every different type of, of disaster that we just, we tend to have a pretty short memory. And so we always think that this time it's different. And this particular type of, of market event is definitely uh, different than the last one. Um, you know, in actuality, it tends to be, uh, you know, again, you have to have context and you have to have patience um, and kind of take a, a really big panned out view uh, and just say, you know, you know, does this change my investment philosophy, right? So um, that being said, um, you know, if you were to, have, so the worst thing you can really do is pull out of the market and just, you know, freak out when the market's down, right? Um, uh, Warren Buffett once said, you know, when, uh, you know, market downturns are when shares are, are returned to their rightful owners, right? Um, and you also said something along the lines of, uh, when the tide goes out, we'll see who's still swimming, right? And so um, uh, these are the times that you, it's really important to stay invested because often after the absolute worst days are the absolute best days of the year, right? So if you'd have missed the, the best 10 days of the year, um, sorry, <laughs> um, historically every year, you would have lost almost 4% uh, on your overall return. You would have miss, missed the best 20 days. You would have had only a 1.58% return. And if you would have missed, missed the best 30 days and so forth, you'd be negative returns over time, right? And so again, um, I keep saying it, but consistency, 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 thinking long-term uh, is really important. Again, that brings me back to why it's important to have a certain amount of cash on hand. That's almost as valuable to just have something to make you feel better about market volatility um, as it is there in case there is some sort of emergency. Generally speaking, you know, unless you're in an IRA and you're younger, um, you know, if it's just a regular investment account, you can, you can access your money at any time. But liquidity is really not a big issue, right? The issue is, is, is the mental accounting and making sure you say, hey, this is reserved on the side for investing. This is for longer term types of investments or saving up for that house or whatever it is. Um, I'm not going to freak out when the market has some fluctuations, right? Um, you know, again, we're going to build it to try to make sure that we, we mitigate that for, uh, from the outset, but or partially mitigate it from the outset. Um, but really thinking about long term and taking a step back and understanding um, that it's about um, you know, a longer journey is super important. Um, so again, um, <clears throat> dollar cost averaging, this is a really good strategy. If you're freaked out, let's just say, you know, and I have a lot of people who will come to me, maybe they'll get a, um, a, an inheritance, right. From, from a family member. It's a big chunk. Um, they don't want to invest at a top, right. One of the best things that you do is what we call dollar cost averaging, right. So this really helps spread out the risk of saying, Hey, maybe, if I am worried about timing, um, which you shouldn't be, um, his, you know, historically speaking, the earlier the better. But if that is a concern for you, then <clears throat> um, we just kind of do what we call dollar cost averaging, which is simply putting in a consistent amount of money every single year, uh, every single month, every single year, you know, uh, just over a series of time, right? So the idea behind this is, and this is what you do with your 401ks, probably. Um, <clears throat> you know, every paycheck you have, you just consider you contribute an amount. Um, and, and that's why it's important to have, you know, especially in your 401k, more aggressive uh, types of exposures, right? So <clears throat> if you had a monthly investment of $500, let's just say the market's down, you can buy 58 uh, shares that, that month, right? Next month, you same $500, market goes up. Great, market's up. Uh, you invest fit. Now you can buy 50 shares, $500 next month, so on and so forth. You can buy 
now you can only buy a 43. Um, April, now the market goes back down, now you're buying 50, right? So, oops, sorry. Um, so the point here is that you're buying more shares at a higher, uh, you're buying fewer shares at a higher price and you're buying less shares at a, uh, or fewer shares at a higher price and more shares at a lower price, right? And so simply by, uh, by doing this, your average share price, sure, was $10, but the cost that you would have had was actually only $9.88, right? So if you look at the share price on average, it was $10, but, um, but because you're buying fewer shares at a higher price and more shares at a lower price, um, the stock market can really be flat, like you can see here, right? Um, it, you know, if it were $10 and they were just fluctuate over time and then ends up back at $10, you actually would have made money over that amount of time simply because you're putting in a consistent amount of, of money. So uh, volatility actually in this type of strategy tends to be your friend. Um, uh, and, it, and it's a good one, especially for younger investors. Um, again, uh, here is, um, here's kind of a, a visual as to why it's important to not only invest early, but, um, but to invest in, um, in, you know, to have a more moderate to aggressive type of, of approach to investing, right? So if you had had $10,000 and you invested in just, you know, bonds, <clears throat> I guess this is more of the money market, the 3% type of, uh, the, the federal bond type of, uh, return, <clears throat> you would have made $18,000, uh, $10,000 after 20 years at 7% would be $38,000. And if you actually invest in the stock, which is more of that bond, uh, type of, uh, of, um, of kind of return. <clears throat> and if you were to invest maybe more in the stock market over that amount of time, that ten, the same $10,000 would be worth about $80,000, right? Um, you know, if you're consistently adding to that, then this just gets more and more astronomical, right? <clears throat> and so again, um, it's more about time in the market than it is timing the market, right? Um, reason being is that we have <clears throat> compound interest, right? Compound interest is essentially the financial equivalent of a snowball rolling down a hill, right? Every year you pick up a little bit of return, uh, then that that ball that you start with the next year gets bigger, right? So if you make 10%, you have $100, <clears throat> makes $101. Now that next year, that $101 makes more money. Now you made $101.1, right? And then so on and so forth. At a certain point, um, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and, um, and that's really what helps prepare you for retirement um, and helps you throughout retirement, to be honest with you. Uh, especially with people living longer, a lot of people make the mistake of, "Hey, I'm I'm going to retire. I'm going to put everything in. You know, I need to get you know get out of the stock market, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, with with kind of how um, how you know healthcare is today, you know, longevity. Uh, if you retire at 65, you still have 20 plus years, um, depending on your genes too, maybe 30 years, um, where you need that money to not only service you throughout retirement, but you need it to grow. Um, and then we talk more about estate planning at that time. So uh, again, brief overview, I'm going to leave some room for questions. I know there's a lot that we went through. Um, and so uh, hopefully your eyes aren't too glazed over um, and I can get to some of the questions. Um, so let's see here. Josh, you want to uh, here. Um, Able to see right. the questions? Sure. Uh, first step to meet with a financial advisor at Cal Coast uh, is you could give us a call. So I have the number here. You reach out to Josh or myself. Feel free to shoot me an email if you'd like as well. Any sort of information that you can give us in terms of what your goals are, um, some of your financial background, your financial picture is helpful as well. So feel free to shoot, uh, give us an email. That'd be great. Uh, oh, and there's a link as well. So, so 
Um, so there's a lot of fear and uncertainty in the financial world. Yes, there is there. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on, right? So we have Ukraine, we have Russia. Um, <clears throat> so when we look at, at issues like Ukraine and, and kind of what's happening in Russia, you have to have context. Um, and you also have to look at at past precedents, right? We have, to, like I said before, the the knee jerk reaction is to say, "Hey, this is this time it's different. There's something going on right now that is is different, and you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, barring a World War Three type of event, which I don't think there's going to be, um, something like this certainly has happened in the past, right? Um, we've actually had the annexation of Crimea back in 2014. Uh, that a lot of people, uh, same thing, Russia invaded Ukraine and took part of it. Um, it seems like Russia is trying to do the same thing in, in a much broader scale at this point, but it looks like they're trying to take just part of Ukraine, not the entire uh, country. Um, and they don't seem to be wanting to, um, uh, you know, st start a world war uh, because they don't have a ton of support on their side, um, you know, from some of uh, some of their allies, which are trying to remain neutral right now. Um, so, uh, yes, it's important to to understand what's going on, and yes, there are risks involved, and yes, you know, energy might go up a little bit, but um, but certainly Russia is not going to stop producing oil. And so if Russia doesn't stop producing oil, then someone's going to buy it, um, you know, for a, probably a lot cheaper than what they're buying oil from other countries. Right. So um, and if that happens, let's just say India, Turkey, um, China. Right. Uh, then maybe they don't need to buy as much oil from, let's just say, the United States. And if the United States has more oil, then maybe we, you know, uh, we could sell more to another country. Right. Because we're a net exporter. And so oil prices globally will probably stay rel relatively under a certain amount, right? So we're probably going to stay reined in because the supply hasn't really necessarily changed globally. Um, you know, we are in an equilibrium as a global, you know, because we are trading globally now, um, you know, at some point, you know, we will see an equilibrium in, and and gas prices will be moderated. Um, you know, we're not going to probably hit that $200 barrel type of space uh, anytime soon. Um, so um, it's important to have some context. Um, also, we've had wars in the past. We've had, you know, and historically, we've seen a downturn of about, um, it's lasted about four months on it. And then prices tend to be uh, higher a year uh past where they were and higher a year later. So, um, so sometimes it's important to take a look at, um, you know, what's happened in the past. And um, somebody asked about buy-ins and minimums. Uh, we actually don't have minimums. Uh, the only thing that we really will have minimums for are annuities, right? Uh, so different products, if there's an insurance product or something like that, sometimes there'll be an, a minimum on those. Um, and we don't really have any um, any control over that, that, but we try to meet all of our members where we're at, where they're at, right? Um, so um, if, if, let's just say you're, so um, thank you for the response here. If a 401k with work might not be enough, uh, are you too late to at 39 to start investing? Absolutely not, right? You're not too late to invest at any age, to be honest with you. Um, but it is important to have exposure to both just a, what we call a tax deferred type of account. So your, your 401k tends to be tax deferred, right? And so I've had clients who've had lots of money in their 401k by the time they retired uh, in their or their IRA. And at that point, maybe they have a ton of money there, but maybe they've been just putting so much away in their 401k uh, that they have maybe $50,000 in cash and then that's it. And so, or $20,000 in cash, right? And so if they have, let's just say an emergency 
right? Or if they want to remodel their house, they want to go on a big vacation. Every single dollar that they have has to come out of this tax deferred account in retirement. And so that all counts as income. So if you have another $100,000 coming out of your, your retirement account on top of Social Security and whatever other pension maybe that you have, um, or maybe income in retirement, um, then you might be bumping yourself up to another tax bracket and you're going to be paying a lot more in taxes. So it's important to have not only as you're saving for retirement, not just putting money in just a tax deferred bucket, but growing another bucket in your maybe an individual type of investment account. Um, and just have some of your cash on hand growing as well with your retirement money. So in the event, you know, when you do retire, if there is maybe a $200,000, you know, expense that you need to pay that year, or if you want to buy a house and put a down payment down, um, you can draw from not just the tax deferred bucket, which is all taxable as income, but also a bucket that is uh, after tax, right? So, um, you know, I would also encourage you to take a look at, you know, maybe putting a small amount into a Roth IRA uh, at work if they have that option for that reason. Uh, hey, Kyle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're uh, a little bit over time here. We're coming up oh, on sorry. the hour mark. So uh, I know there's a bunch of other questions that have come in. Is that all right if I uh, send you some of the questions and maybe you can respond individually? Yep. Sure. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. For those of you that still have questions, we'll be sure to answer those for you. Um, sure. But in the meantime, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, please feel free to visit our website to schedule an appointment with Kyle and his team. Uh, or uh, obviously you can uh, give Kyle a call or shoot him an email. Yep. Uh, and uh, thank you, Kyle, for presenting. I, I knew there was going to be a ton of info to get through. So <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, no, no reason to apologize. It's a lot of great stuff. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're always available. Uh, you can always reach out to us through um, a branch. You can call, you can uh, go online to our website. You can even ask us questions on social media. We're very responsive there. So uh, contact us anytime. Uh, so we'll follow up with you in the meantime. I just want to yep. respect everyone's uh, time today. So yeah. thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Kyle. And we'll yep. see you, you for it. our next webinar uh, next month. Thanks, guys. Sorry. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.